Lost in an alligator-infested swamp, 11-year-old Nadia faces a five-day battle wow. for her life. To have her out there, to not know where she was, it was devastating. A camping trip turns to every parent's worst nightmare. When a nine-year-old gets lost in a vast wilderness in a life-threatening storm. I believe that my son was dead. A 17-year-old crashes her dad's SUV. Literally, she vanished. And disappears without a trace. You can't hide a truck that size. How long can these kids survive? It's no longer a rescue mission, but a recovery mission. It's a beautiful spring afternoon, and 11-year-old Nadia Bloom is heading out for a bike ride. I read a book about nature, and I thought I wanted to see some for myself. I wanted to get out there. I wanted to explore. Nadia suffers from Asperger's syndrome, a form of autism that means she sometimes has difficulties relating to people and an obsessive interest in certain subjects. Her greatest passion, the natural world. It's like so amazing. So many things that animals can do that we can't. 300 yards from Nadia's home sits a conservation area with two large freshwater ponds. Nadia's excited to take some photos with her new digital camera. The pond near my house, it's pretty cool. I go there just to snap photos. It's very peaceful, except for the fact there are alligators. But what Nadia is secretly interested in is the woods beyond the pond, where nature really gets wild. It's a place she's been told never to go into alone. So this is what the world beyond buildings is like. There are no buildings, no, no pollution. It was just awesome. But this is no wonderland. The woods are alive with deadly snakes and spiders. And they open on to the swamps of Lake Jessup, home to 10,000 alligators. Less than half a mile away, Mom Tanya wonders why Nadia isn't yet home from her bike ride. Our neighborhood's very small. We live in a gated community. 20 minutes, she should have been back. I went out the front door thinking she's going to circle around the neighborhood and I'm going to say, you know, time to come in. Unable to see Nadia, Tanya drives around the neighborhood. Eventually, she reaches the pond. I walked out there and my first reaction was, I don't see her. And I just grabbed the baby out of the car and started calling her name. Nadia! She's always told Nadia never to cross the water and go into the swamp beyond. Nadia! But when she gets to the forbidden boundary, she's in for a shock. Just to see her bike there and not her. It's just like when a mother goes to the store and, you know, for a second turns her back and the kid goes around another aisle. You know, there's a moment, oh, where's my child? But you always turn around and you find them, and I can't find her. And there's no immediate, oh, there you are. Nadia! Each time I called her name, it became louder and more panicked. Nadia! Nadia! I can't believe I have to call 911. Nadia! Nadia! I'm trying to keep myself calm, but at the same time, to have her out there, to not know where she was, was it was devastating. All the while, Nadia, obliviously pursuing her fascination with nature, heads deeper into the treacherous swamp. Everything was looking the same. They couldn't figure which was the way out. In the dense undergrowth, it takes seconds to get disoriented. And very quickly, Nadia's in serious trouble. I realized I was lost, so I tried to retrace my steps, but the forest looked pretty much the same after a while, and... 
I couldn't retrace my steps. As she wanders through the swamp, her situation is about to get worse. I lost my glasses. I, I almost cried because I'd relied on my glasses for a very, very long time and... Barely able to see, the already confusing swamp becomes a hopeless blur. Spotting predators will now be impossible. What chance is there that Nadia can make it out of the woods alive? Twelfth grader Courtney Tebow has just turned 17. And when she's not studying or cheerleading, she enjoys hanging out with friends. As fall comes around, she passes her driving test. When I got my driver's license, it was kind of just like a sense of freedom. Today, Courtney is excited because her dad has agreed to loan his beloved truck to her for the evening. I was excited. I was wearing pretty much all new clothes. I had my brand new shoes on, so I was like looking good. The SUV was all black. It had all black interior, leather seats. He had serious radio in it. All my friends would be like, whoa, you're driving a really nice SUV. I'd be like, yes, my dad. <laughs> but there's just one rule. Courtney has to be home by midnight. But it's already past 12, and Courtney's still hanging out with friends. My dad called around midnight. I was really scared, actually. I thought he was going to be mad because he had specifically said, be home by midnight. Immediately, Courtney steps out into the freezing night and heads home. The inexperienced young driver is traveling close to the speed limit of 55 miles an hour. There was nobody out. I didn't really see any cars. Just kind of cruising along, listening to music, just thinking about the night. But as she comes over a hill, she believes she sees a deer in the road. Oversteering, she quickly loses control of the car. Remember the tree line coming closer. And after that, I don't remember. Coming up, in a treacherous mountain range, a nine-year-old Boy Scout faces a freezing night in a terrifying storm. Lost in the wilderness, alone. I had an absolute fear for the welfare and safety of my son. It was a matter of life and death. On a freezing November night, Courtney Tebow has crashed her dad's treasured truck into a ravine. falling tree has hidden the wreck from view. I woke up and it was kind of like in a haze. She's broken both of her legs, smashed her jaw, and is pinned against the steering wheel. There's blood everywhere. It's overwhelming. I cried at the point that I made myself vomit. No! No! I'd never cried like that before. <laughs> With puncture wounds to her torso, any movement causes more bleeding. If Courtney's not found soon, she could bleed to death. Five miles away, Courtney's dad has spent a sleepless night. I stayed up worrying and texting her. Initial feeling is anger. Why you disobey me? You assume that she'd just joyride and her hanging with her friends. He repeatedly tries her cell, but Courtney, trapped by the steering wheel, can't reach it. At 5 a.m., unaware Courtney's had an accident, Gary makes a difficult call to his ex-wife. 
I'm mad. I actually remember thinking, okay, now I gotta take the car away from her. She, you know, did something stupid. You know, she's gotta have a restriction for this. Kathy begins phoning her friends. I went through all the caller ID, called everybody on the caller ID. I didn't care who it was. I started at the top of the list. Have you seen Courtney? Do you know Courtney? We figured she might have had a little accident and scared to come home because she damaged the car or something. But neither the police nor the hospitals have reported an accident. So Kathy and Gary take to the road. I drove around the whole neighborhood. I was just figuring the truck had to be somewhere. You can't hide a truck that size. But the truck is nowhere to be found. You think the cats show up? Oh, literally, she vanished. It's the middle of summer in Utah, and 10,000 feet up in the mountains, Nine-year-old Grayson Wynn is on a very special camping trip with his dad and brothers. I was really excited to go on the backpacking trip. I like camping, hiking, fishing. I like the outdoors a lot. Dad Keenan is proud to bring his son on the trip. These type of experiences don't come along all the time, and so it was very important to me that all three of my boys be able to participate. My wife did share concerns of his age. She didn't put her foot down and say, no, he absolutely can't come. I had to promise that I would keep an extra close eye on him. I thought that I was growing up. I wasn't a little kid, and I really did not want to stay home and play with the girls. After five days of camping and fishing, it's time to break camp. As the group begins to make the five-hour descent down the mountain, the sky suddenly darkens, and the wind begins to howl. It was pretty extreme weather. My concern was to get everybody off the mountain as quick as possible. At this high altitude, changes in weather can be lethal. The horses struggle on the treacherous terrain and Keenan is forced to stop. The pack saddles had come loose. It took several of the adults to help to get that saddle re-tightened up. Four of the boys, including Grayson, continue on and quickly move out of sight. But the nine-year-old can't keep up with the older boys, and when he comes to a fork in the trail, he heads in the wrong direction. It's not until his dad reaches the parking lot that anyone notices Grayson's missing. My dad was the last one out, and, uh, and he was number 14. And I instantly knew we were missing somebody. And it just it took a matter of microseconds till I realized it was Grayson. Where's Grayson? What? In the raging storm, Lost somewhere in the vast million-acre forest is his youngest son. I had absolute fear for the welfare and safety of my son. I instantaneously recognized that it was a matter of life and death. With three hours until darkness, Grayson is in serious danger. Treacherous ravines, mountain and wolves all hide in the forest. But in this storm, Keenan's biggest concern is the potentially freezing night ahead. Hypothermia is a very real concern. If you're in an accident in an advanced state of hypothermia, you're so far from civilization, you are truly all alone. I literally just, in a panic, just turned around and sprinted back up the trail. It was just a, a howling of the wind that suppressed any yelling effort. Yet, uh, I, I, I couldn't turn back. I needed to close the distance between a father and a son. Coming up, 
In freezing Maine, Courtney's parents pass within yards of where their daughter lies dying. I'm gonna get hypothermia, or I may even die of hypothermia. How will Courtney survive the night? I thought I was going to die. Lost in an alligator-infested swamp, Nadia Bloom is left half-blinded by the loss of her glasses. A massive search and rescue operation is underway. It's a race against time to find the 11-year-old before dark. But there's no trace of the missing girl. As it got darker, before we knew it, there was night vision goggle people and, and SWAT teams walking the woods. And... I know the word surreal is very cliche, but that's the only word I know how to describe how it was. Are you guys okay there? Everything okay? I start to worry, you know, because she's she's got to be cold. And I'm thinking this child's wearing basically nothing. She has shorts and shirts. How how she feel? But initially. Nadia's less scared than intrigued. Sleeping in the woods was a little scary, but I thought it was kind of magical. It was very beautiful. There were trees, and sometimes I could look up and see the stars. I think an owl turned its head to me and hooted as if to say, you will survive. I know it, you will survive. But as the clock passes midnight, the temperature plummets and the cold begins to bite. It was cold, it was freezing, and I was shivering and my teeth were chattering. I felt as if I'd freeze to death. I had nothing to stay warm, literally. Nothing. In a vast million-acre forest, Grayson Wynn was last seen descending a mountain in a fierce storm. With an hour until dusk, Grayson is increasingly scared. It, it took about an hour before I realized that I was lost. I, I was yelling and trying to see if anybody would hear me. It was really scary when nobody yelled back. Struggling on the treacherous terrain in an attempt to cover ground more easily, Grayson decides to abandon his backpack. It was kind of starting to feel a little heavy. My shoulders were getting sore. But by dropping the pack, Grayson has discarded the very thing that will enable him to survive the freezing night ahead, his sleeping bag. <laughs> Nearly half a day has passed since Courtney Tebow wrecked her dad's car. She's broken both of her legs and lost a serious amount of blood. She's barely 60 feet away from a highway where 20,000 vehicles pass each day. Yet camouflaged by a tree, no one sees her. Not even her parents, who pass within yards of where their daughter lies dying. Nobody knew where she was. Nobody. Maybe she was abducted. I didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to think of that, even though in the back of my head I was thinking it. The more time that passes, the less likely she'll be found alive. It was just prior to darkness when we started making flyers. We handed out flyers to everybody, thousands of them. I had a hard time handing them out. I cannot hand them out to people. I couldn't explain to people that my daughter's missing. 
once we handed the flyers, there's not as much we could do. We've done it. Everything. We looked everywhere. We drove everywhere. Everybody looked. Nothing. In the dark ravine, Courtney, trapped, alone, and in pain, seeks any comfort she can find. My dad had a big cop flashlight that he always had in his truck for if he broke down or something. So I had that. I turned that on at night so I wouldn't sit in the dark. So it was scary. I tried shining it in the woods. I was hoping that it would help somebody find me. But still, no one comes. Her body's in shock from horrific injuries that include a broken jaw and crushed legs. And freezing temperatures could cause her organs to shut down. I'm freezing, like teeth chittering, my body shaking because I was so cold. I was thinking, oh, I'm gonna get hypothermia or I may even die of hypothermia. I thought I was going to die. Coming up, police failed to trace Courtney's phone. I was so confident, how could she be wrong? And a helicopter search for Nadia is abandoned. I felt hopeless. Not upset, but hopeless. Alone in an alligator-infested swamp, Nadia Bloom has spent a day searching without her glasses for a way out. As a helicopter searches from the air, ground rescuers cover themselves from head to toe to protect from snakes and mosquitoes, cutting through the undergrowth with machetes. But dressed only in a small t-shirt and shorts, Nadia is exposed to bites. She's also lost the shoes that protect her feet. The mosquitoes are so annoying. They were all over my arms, legs, face, neck, feet. And it, and, it, and it was extremely painful. Nadia has had no food or water for over a day. As the temperature hits the 90s, she's at risk of severe dehydration that could cause vomiting and unconsciousness. People would come up and say, you know, she's a smart girl. She's going to come walking out of those woods any minute. And I'm thinking, you're just supposed to be saying that to me. Nadia's smart, but she's book smart. She's not survival smart. But it's Nadia's book smart knowledge that will help quench her thirst. She knows that it's dangerous to drink the water in the swamp. It's then that she notices fresh rainwater collected in a plant. I saw some insects eating it, and I recognized it as edible. The insects didn't die or anything, so it wasn't poisonous. And I think I recognized it as water hyacinth, which is an edible plant. And so I used my brains out there. But the small sips of water will only stave off the effects of dehydration temporarily. Suddenly, Nadia hears a helicopter overhead. I saw the helicopter, I, I heard it say my name, so I knew it was looking for me. So I tried to get its attention by, by calling out to it. Help! Help! Although she can see the rescue craft, for the searching pilot, it's impossible to spot her through the thick, triple-layer tree canopy. Using infrared cameras that sense temperature changes, the pilot tries to locate Nadia by looking for a match to her body temperature. Over here, help! Help! I followed it, and it gave me a chance of finding my home. But in the searing Florida day, the air temperature in the swamp is the same as Nadia's body heat the aerial search is abandoned. Sometimes I feared I would never get out. I felt hopeless. Not upset, but hopeless.
Courtney Tebow lies trapped in a wrecked SUV with no food or water. She's lost a huge amount of blood, and it's a miracle she's made it through the freezing winter night. But as the search moves into its second day, there's been a breakthrough. Police have contacted Courtney's cell phone service, and they've located the phone's signal to a specific mast. She had to be in a pie-shaped radius of probably less than five miles in that tower's range. The search plane hones in on the radius of the mobile phone mast, while Courtney's parents and police comb the forest floor. I was so confident that that woman from the, the phone company was right. How could she be wrong? You know, the, these people know what they're talking about. They've got to do, you see it on TV. Yet the search reveals no trace of Courtney or the missing vehicle. above sea level, nine-year-old Grayson Wynn is lost in a vast forest. As the storm rages, temperatures hit the low 40s. Dad Keenan knows his son is at risk of freezing to death. Uh, I thought to myself, he'll be smart. He'll use his sleeping bag, and it will help him stay warm through the night. And that's what I pinned all my hopes on. But Grayson is without a sleeping bag, since he discarded his backpack. Soaked to the bone, Boy Scout Grayson has constructed a rudimentary shelter. I still got wet, but I think it helped a little bit. It was too cold for me to fall asleep. Now suffering the effects of hypothermia, time is running out for Grayson. I prayed that I would get found and that light would come. I was really depressed. I was thinking I might not make it through the night, that I might never see my family again. Down the mountain, his mother arrives and is greeted by her desperate husband. We just cried. Then when Keenan could talk, he just said, I can't face you, I've lost your son. I looked in his eyes, and I could see into his soul. I, I didn't blame him, and I knew that his heart was absolutely broken, and it broke mine. It's always been important for me as a parent to be able to be there for my children, to fix their problems, to be able to comfort, to be able to comfort them when they were hurt or lonely or scared. I have never in my life felt so much despair and fear and uh, a, a, a genuine sense of failure that I failed uh, my son and my family in general. As the storm continues, Keenan knows it's unlikely that his son will make it through the night. I was desperately doing everything that I could physically, mentally, uh, emotionally do, and it wasn't enough. Coming up, Nadia loses hope. Maybe they think I was dead. I wasn't dead. While evidence is found that suggests Grayson hasn't survived. It was no longer a rescue mission, but a recovery mission. Nadia Bloom has been alone in a huge swamp for four days without food or water. Half blinded by the loss of her glasses and having lost her shoes, the open cuts on her feet have caused her to pick up a blood infection that needs urgent treatment. Yet just when it seems unlikely she will ever find her way out, she sees some rooftops. I thought I saw a house, 
It was green with a white roof on it. I could see it. It had a swing on the porch. There were three Barbie dolls, and it was like maybe some, some children lived there. And I was thinking, if I went there, maybe I could ask for directions. And so, I am, um, I tried to knock on the door, but all I knocked on was a tree branch because the house was really just a mirage. After three nights in the swamp, dehydration and hunger are causing Nadia to suffer extreme bouts of delirium. Another mirage I saw was, I thought I saw my own mom behind me. Nadia! And I thought I was um, gonna be rescued by my own mom, which would have been a very, very wonderful thing. I was fighting against crying because I thought I was going to be helped. I just didn't want to cry because I would be embarrassed even though there was nobody around but me. Lost in a million-acre forest, Grayson Wynn has miraculously survived till dawn. Determined not to spend another night on the mountain, Grayson is taking matters into his own hands. That's when I started ripping up my rain poncho and tying it to the trees. I thought that somebody could get on that trail and follow me and, ma and maybe catch up and find me. Meanwhile, as the storm recedes, a search helicopter takes to the air. As we searched, I heard the helicopter fly. I expected at any moment to get news, hey, we found him, we found him. News comes over the radio. It's not the yellow strips of plastic, but Grayson's backpack that's been found. So I heard that they had found the backpack. I was just ecstatic. And so in my mind, I thought, this is good news, right? And so I had run into the search and rescue and I had actually said that. Is it good news? Is it good news? But Grayson is not with the backpack. I needed to know if his sleeping bag was in the backpack. Because in my mind, everything that I'd been able to visualize through the whole night was that he was going to use a sleeping bag. And they radioed back and said everything appeared to be intact and I just felt and slumped to the ground. Because in my mind, there's no way without that sleeping bag that he could have made it through the night. In my mind at that point, it was no longer a rescue mission, but a recovery mission. And I couldn't be a part of that. Coming up, Courtney gives up hope. I hadn't heard voices for like two days. And Nadia's parents fear the worst. And I didn't want it to be the alternative. A fourth night falls for Nadia lost in the swamp. She knows her chances of making it to a fifth morning are slim. I prayed to God that he would work a miracle in my life and let me survive and, and that um, I would get to see my family and that I would trust in him more. And I, and, I, and I seriously meant it. I meant it more than I meant anything I'd ever said in my life. I am with you wherever you 
Losing hope, Nadia comforts herself by singing. I missed my house, I missed my room, I missed, I especially missed my family. I imagine they were probably crying, they were probably worrying about me, that maybe they would even think I was dead. I wasn't dead. You wrestled because you know the ending could be a very bad alternative. And not wanting to know that if we did have a death in the family of a child, the impact it would have on our family. And I didn't want it to be the alternative. It's past midnight, and nearly two days since Courtney Tebow wrecked her dad's SUV and vanished without a trace. As hope begins to fade, a lone cop searching down a highway near where she was last seen notices a damaged tree by the side of the road. Cut into the dirt is a small tire track. I hadn't heard voices for like two days, so when I heard talking, I just, I was like, oh my gosh, there's somebody here, there's somebody coming. Help! I got really excited. I'm here! Just as we're getting ready to leave, my phone rings. I just, I just screamed. She's alive, and they found her, and she's alive, and she's alive! But it takes firefighters over two hours to cut her from the vehicle. First thing she said to me was, Dad, I'm sorry about the truck. I said, I want to get out of that thing anyways. She's rushed to the hospital for emergency surgery to save her left leg and fix her shattered jaw. And I was surprised when I woke up and my mouth was wide shut. I actually couldn't talk. For the first week or so, I had a whiteboard that I could write on. She couldn't even speak. And she had to write down, when can I drive? Well, let's start with talking and walking, then we'll talk about driving. It takes several months for Courtney to be able to walk again. But six months later, she's back on the road. After 20 hours searching, Keenan Wynn is coming to terms with the idea that his son is no longer alive. I believe that my son was dead somewhere on that mountain. It was a terrible feeling as a parent to, to feel as an absolute total failure as a father. Then a radio transmission comes through. There's been an unconfirmed sighting of Grayson. Instantly, my mind said, is he alive? And I just sat on the log and waited. I'm scared to hope, scared what the bad news might be. Finally, the radio crackles back to life. Grayson is alive. Oh, yes! I collapsed again just out of joy and In a meadow not far from the backpack, two ranchers have found Grayson. They said, are you Grayson Wynn? And I'm like, yeah. And then they gave me some food and water. I was really happy. I was about to cry, but I don't think I did. Against all the odds, Grayson has survived the freezing night virtually unscathed. I don't think the human mind and emotion and heart was designed to go from that low to the high that I went because it would just, I don't even think I walked off that mountain. I think I more floated off of it. 
when I stepped foot in the ambulance, uh, Grayson looked at me with a big smile on his face. He said, uh, happy Father's Day, Dad. And uh, it indeed was. In the swamps of Orlando, Nadia Bloom, lost for five days without food or water, has given up hope of ever being found. Nadia! I heard somebody calling out, Nadia, are you there? And my ears immediately perked up. Nadia! After days of strange visions, Nadia does not know if she can trust her ears. Nadia! It's like, it was the first human voice I'd heard in a long time. I was like, Yes, I am here. I'm right in the middle of the forest. It was like the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, I was finally relieved because it wasn't a mirage. Incredibly, after four nights alone in the swamp and a search operation involving hundreds of people, Nadia has been found by a local volunteer. When James King told dispatchers he had found Nadia, they wanted to hear her voice. Hi, this is Nadia and I'm the girl who got lost. But police failed to get accurate coordinates from the mobile phone, and the helicopter can't locate them. When King found her, they were in such a densely wooded, swampy area that it took rescuers hours to reach them. Thinking on his feet, King unfurls two rolls of toilet paper, making a sign visible from the air. And the toilet paper and the helicopter, that was really awesome. I never knew toilet paper could save someone's life. A joyous, joyous occasion for family, friends, everybody, really, who was involved in this, as you can see. It was the best news I ever got in my life. I started to cry, and the only other time in my life that I had that sort of tears of joy is when Nadia was born. Elated, ecstatic, I mean, there's just... The English language, you know, you have these really great words, but it doesn't really encompass the feelings you felt. You know, it was just incredible. Although it takes two hours to get her out of the swamp, after a 115-hour ordeal, without food or water, Nadia is left with no serious injuries. When I saw my neighborhood, I felt like I was more relieved than I would ever have thought I would be, like, even though my neighborhood usually isn't utopia, it felt like the best place in the world to me when I saw it. 